Well, I would like to welcome you all this morning. I'm John Magnuson with the Cedar Tree Institute, and we're here to launch Earth Keepers 2, an interfaith environmental initiative. This is building on the work that our collaborative communities participated in from 2004 to 2009. And thanks to the United States Forest Service and the United States Environmental Protection Agency, we've been given the opportunity to continue the work in the coming two years with a focus on energy conservation and community gardens. At the heart of this work is a group of students. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce them to you and then they will introduce our representatives that come from our various faith traditions. But I'd like to begin by just a comment and a reflection on some writings and contributions from a Roman Catholic theologian by the name of Thomas Berry. Berry began the religious studies program at Fordham University and he was awarded uh, right before his death in the early uh, part of the century uh, the award from the United Nations for an outstanding contribution to protect the environment. What Barry suggested was that we are in a time of what he called the great work. The great work. And it has to do with reconnecting with the earth and becoming more responsible and more creative stewards of the creation that we find ourselves living in. Barry was a very prophetic voice. He called this the great work for today as part of uh, our faith communities to join with other environmental groups and organizations to bring our gifts, rituals of meaning, networks of volunteers, and hands-on projects to help make this beautiful promise unfold. So I'm going to turn now to introduce you to the heart of this project in the next two years. There are a student team. They are all university students from Northern Michigan University. One of them is the daughter of a shepherd. And uh, I would like to introduce Tom Merkel, who will introduce the team. And, and Tom is a student and a leader in the, uh, one of our campus ministries at Northern. So Thomas, please. Hello and welcome. My name is Tom Merkel, and I'd like to introduce Bishop Thomas Greenis from the Northern Great Lakes Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. We are together today as representatives of the interfaith ecumenical community, and I'm grateful that uh, Pastor Magnuson and students here have received this work that we can do together and to support this ministry. You know, I was thinking about driving in this morning, I was thinking about uh, the winter and the winter of our lives and, and how it is the seasons change. The seasons definitely change up, up here. We notice that tremendously. You know, when I was a boy, I remember going to uh, a birthday party for a fellow who turned 100 years of age. And that was very impressive to me way back then uh, when I was in grade school that, that there, somebody would live to be a hundred and I could see that person. And I said to that uh, fellow, how is it that uh, you got to be a hundred? And he said, I don't know except I have tried to take care of my neighbors and take care of the gifts that I have been given and take care of myself. And that was a word for me of stewardship. And that's what we're about, really. Um, all the faith communities want to talk about how stewardship is important. Taking care of what has been given to us, that is, the wonderful nature and the wonderful opportunities here, here in our area of the world. And how we can use those resources to the glory of God and also for the future generations to be used so we're thankful that uh, this, this grant, this opportunity, this uh, work has continuing and that new things will be done. And I want to, on behalf of the Lutheran community here in the Upper Peninsula, to pledge our support and our encouragement for this work and how we can achieve these good things together as we do stewardship here on the banks of uh, 
Lake Superior. Thank you, Bishop. I was prepared to introduce Reverend Paul Lehman of the Buddhist community, but he is recovering from an illness, and he does send his greetings. But now I'll introduce Bishop Alexander Sample of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Marquette. I'm very, very happy and honored uh, to be a part again uh, of the Earth Keepers Initiative. Uh, I was in part of the, the last great effort that, that we had with Earth Keepers, where we did a lot about the proper disposal of, of things that can be harmful to our environment. And uh, to, to see Earth Keepers sort of get resurrected and get a new life through the generosity of, of the grants that has been given is, is a great encouragement. And what I'm particularly uh, impressed with and touched by, quite honestly, is, is really the involvement of the young people. Um, clearly, uh, the youth uh, of, our, of our communities have a great concern and a great love for, for the beauty of, of creation and all of the, the rich natural resources that, that God has provided for us. So to see young people uh, step forward and take leadership in, in helping us preserve all that, that has been given to us is, is a great encouragement and a sign of hope for me, truly, for, for the future. You know, from the Roman Catholic perspective, uh, you know, we have a great concern for the care, the proper care uh, of our creation. In fact, uh, our, our Pope, uh, the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, who is often, you know, he's an old uh, man, certainly. He's, he's a, very much a senior citizen, older than my own mother. And, uh, and he's seen as a, a very, a very uh, serious theologian. And he is a theologian. His whole background is as a theologian. And I think many were surprised when uh, Pope Benedict XVI came out very early on during his time as, as leader of the Roman Catholic Church throughout the world, speaking about our responsibility toward the, the creation that has been entrusted to us. And he's made a very serious point of bringing it up at other times again and again, that this is, this is an obligation that we have as people of faith to take care of the gifts that God has given to us. And I, uh, as the, the local Roman Catholic representative of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, am very, very proud to be a part of this, to put our effort, our energy, our support behind it, and to be involved in, in a very particular way. To see this coming down into our church communities uh, is, I think, a very uh, important part of this. That this is going to touch uh, the faith communities in a very special way, not only benefiting our communities in terms of energy efficiency and perhaps some, some beautiful green spaces and gardens, but it, it will also bring an awareness, a deeper awareness, to our local communities of faith of just how important it is that we take care of this, not just for ourselves today, but for the future generations, for these young people and, and for the young people that will come after them. So I, I thank you all for coming, and, and, I, and I'm very proud to be a part of this coalition. My name is Caitlin Bingner, and I would like to introduce Mike Grossman, representing the Jewish community of Temple Bath Shalom. Yes, uh, as a member of Temple Beth Shalom, which is a synagogue in Ishpeming, I'm happy to make a few comments, but I thought you'd be better served by having my wife make them, Helen. So I want to introduce Helen, who is not only a retired chemistry and science teacher, which has a lot to do with the environment, but a retired teacher at the uh, synagogue, and she taught our children Hebrew to learn for their bar and bat mitzvah. So she's well-rounded. <laughs> Thank you. It's really nice to become part of this project. Um, I personally have had a great interest in working with the youth in our community, and it's wonderful to see, again, young people being involved in this project. And specifically in the Jewish community, there's a long-standing tradition in Judaism that um, honors the earth and honors the stewardship of the earth we have several holidays actually that celebrate that stewardship and actually, you know, command us really to honor the earth and to take care of the earth. One of these is Tu B'Shvat, which actually begins in February and it's traditionally a time for planting of trees in Israel and also for setting aside money to provide food for the poor. So it seems very, very appropriate that this project, Earth Keepers 2, will plant community gardens 
which will then be contributing to food pantries, so it really seems to fit quite well with the tradition that we have in Judaism. Another thing that I think um, is really important is that one of the most important holidays in Judaism is the celebration of Shabbat, which in English would be the Sabbath. That is, of course, mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. And one of the things about Shabbat is that it is a time for rest and reflection. But one of the sort of interpretations also that's really quite ancient is that Shabbat is a time to celebrate what is good about the world today, but to also work for the redemption of the world. And one of the ancient writings, the ancient books that is the wisdom of, of the rabbis, called the Talmud, says that if everyone in the world would just celebrate two consecutive Shabbats by redeeming the world, working to improve our environment and our world, that everything would be an apropos way to, to summarize the importance of the environment and our stewardship of the earth. Now I'd like to introduce Nancy Auer, representing the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Michigan. Well, today I represent the Episcopal Church in Northern Michigan. Our Bishop, Rayford Ray, asked me to substitute for him today because he is actually at a Justice and Peace Conference our diocese is having in Escanaba, and he's working on an oral health initiative similar to what we're doing here today for the environment. I was asked to represent the Episcopal Church. Uh, I was very blessed to be with the first Earth Keepers movement when John and Charlie West were involved and uh, we did a lot of the e-waste collections and now I'm really excited to have some of our churches become uh, more energy efficient as well as help in community affairs. We're excited in my own little parish in Calumet, Michigan, where we've been trying to start up a community garden for a while, and now we'll have the impetus and the energy to do that. And I'm very grateful, again, too, for the students that are here. Actually, you may not know it, but the woman to my left, Kira, was actually one of my graduate students many years ago. So uh, the environmental movement and the faith movement are critical movements to join together and through those people we can actually touch and make a difference in the world. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Adam Magnuson and I'd like to introduce uh, Doug Russell. He's with uh, Delta Green and he'll be talking about energy efficiency with the grant. Delta Green is the technical partner uh, for this grant project and our function within the grant will be to perform energy audits uh, for 40 churches across the Upper Peninsula. This audit will serve as a blueprint for churches to look at ways for them to uh, increase their energy efficiency and in that way save them money uh, and of course one of the unfortunate byproducts of energy production is pollution. By being able to increase their efficiencies, the churches will be contributing to less energy production and less pollution. So we look forward to being able to work with the churches to identify those opportunities and help them uh, understand all the different resources that are available uh, to make those projects happen. Thank you. Up next we have Kira Fillmore, who is our project coordinator. Hi. Uh, another component of our grant is um, a, a vision that we've had for a while and we're very excited to have it finally be able to come to fruition, and that is community church gardens, whether it be a vegetable garden, a healing garden, a meditation garden, herb garden, um, native plant garden. We're hoping that the gardens can bring people closer to God's creation by working in the earth, um, as well as closer to each other. And to help us with that uh, is our partner with the U.S. Forest Service, the Eastern Region Chief Botanist, Jan Schultz. I'm, I'm very pleased and, and really proud to be a, a part of this um, project. And um, I know that very good things will come from this. I'm, I'm very comfortable in saying that. Um, so when I think of this project, I think of the word source. And there are several segments of this that have to do with that, that notion. <clears throat> the notion of, of sources and of these religious facilities as sources. Obviously, we've heard about uh, 
the energy conservation and these institutions, these facilities serve as sources for that you know, information and the insight and the uh, things related to energy. So that they become a source for that and it's very inspirational. The other part of this that several folks mentioned, Kira just uh, mentioned it, are the gardens. The sources relative to the gardens are, are about threefold. Uh, one of the sources has to do with the notion of, of food for people, vegetable gardens, and produce that goes to those who may need it. I mean, what a delight to have fresh produce, uh, especially in this part of the world, <laughs> especially now. Um, so the idea of taking a seed and soil and sunlight and poking that seed down in the soil and having sunlight, I didn't say sunshine, I said sunlight. <laughs> and the production of something that's just nutritious and helpful to people is amazing. It's a delight. I giggle when I, when I do that in my backyard. What an amazing thing. And the miracle of photosynthesis to take carbon and all these other attributes and to make it into a product that's sustainable. Wow. So these facilities serve in that source and it's inspirational in that capacity. The facilities serve as a source for information and as examples for the control of non-native invasive species. And this is a little bit more murky to look at. If you look, for instance, at a typical churchyard, there's shrubbery, there's grass, there's a few weeds, there's some spaces that look better than others. But probably in most of those facilities, we would have, for example, the non-native honeysuckles. They have pink or white flowers, they smell fabulous, they produce thousands of red berries that the birds love. And on that facility, they don't really make much of a negative dent. But if you walk down the road into unrefined wood lots in woods, the non-native honeysuckles that represent the, a monoculture in the understory is really, really problematic and really destructive. So the notion of being a source for the inspiration of the control of these um, ecosystem altering non-native invasive species is a good thing. And also not being the source of them is a good thing. And then, let's see, my third source related portion of this has to do with the native plants that present an option for some of these facilities and the native pollinators that require them and tend them. It looks like such a small thing, but it really isn't. For example, when we grow vegetables, we have to have these uh, honeybees and these other native plant insects pollinate our fruit and, and vegetables. We all know that, but what we don't know is that they might not be always present when the squash blossoms are blooming. So if they don't have another source of food while our vegetables are growing, our vegetables won't be pollinated. These small native gardens serve as the pollinator source for the vegetable garden, not just in that churchyard, but in the neighborhood. And that is really a delightful thing. My native plant garden in Milwaukee is about 20 feet by 15 feet. And I've got all kinds of native plants in there. And it is just a delight for me to see my workers in there uh, in the morning and coming back in the evening, the um, male um, bombus or bumblebees roost in the, in, the, uh, in the plants in my garden. My garden serves as a repository for those native bees and other pollinators for my whole urban community. And I see them coming back from Kmart, Walmart, and everywhere else with their little pots of tomatoes in, you know, after Labor Day when it's clear, we're certain there's not gonna be any frost. 
and I feel an incredible amount of delight thinking that my 15 by 20 foot uh, little confab of my native plants helps us to sustain, really and truly helps us to sustain their vegetable garden. So those church lots and other uh, facilities related to that really do matter and what we are doing really does matter. So I'm delighted. You know, one of the recurrent themes in all the great religious traditions is that, that which the world rejects, uh, God does the real work. That which is small, great things come. That, that which is rejected. And uh, one of the fascinating parts of uh, this ongoing uh, work, this great work, uh, is to partner with the Native American communities here in the Upper Peninsula. They have struggled, those of you who know your history, in over generations fighting to protect their sovereignty and their traditions and their teachings. They are joining us uh, as partners in this initiative. And what I've got here is from the Keweenaw Bay Greenhouse that was built in 2010. These are native plants. You cannot buy these in Walmart. They're not available at Shopco. You can't get these by sending out to a seed company. These are hard, hand-harvested seeds. These are going to be partnered with our gardens, our church gardens. So we will be working with tribes, especially Keweenaw Bay, to help, uh, help their efforts and also to spread and bring back the native plants. And uh, through this snowstorm today, uh, they drove down two hours to be with us through the snow. And I want to honor them and uh, just have them bring us a word of blessing. Could you bring a word to us? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we brought some of our native plants in our uh, medicines. Um, the sweet grass is for smudging. Looks like it got a little cold. <laughs> um, and we have sweet flag or uh, sweet fern, and that's a medicine in our um, midday lodge in our, or in our sweat lodges and stuff. Um, and the flowers are native, and it brings all the good animals, like everybody was talking about. Um, the, the greenhouse is doing wonderfully. It smells like life in there. Oh, all green. That up. Why don't you lift that? That, it took, that took place oh. in the dedication of the greenhouse in mm -hmm. 2010. The first one east of the Mississippi. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have a restoration site where we plant all the native uh, plants. And we, have, we, ca we did a capstone, is that what it is? Yes. Yes, and right. we put uh, soil on top of crushed mine. And, and thank you yeah. for being our partner. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful project. You should come see it. Thank you. Okay. So to close the conference here, uh, two days ago I was on, on the Sioux St. Marie Tribal Reservation, and uh, I was talking about this project, and I was sitting across from a tribal member, Catherine Brosmer, and I was talking about this event today. And without, without a blink of the eye, she said this to me. I have no doubt that no plant will spring from the land without seed being sown. But I have faith in seeds. Convince me that there's a seed there, and I will expect great wonders. <laughs> and I went, what? And she said, Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> so uh, that, I'm going to use that uh, quote to close us. And again, uh, honoring all our speakers, especially our Native friends who have come from the Keweenaw Bay community. Uh, we have uh, a blessing that we're going to invite one of our longtime leaders and respected teachers in this project, Charlie West, United Methodist pastor, to lead us in, to bless us. We have food for everybody. 
And although some may have to hit the road right away, we also have gifts for everyone. Uh, one of the, the protocols of this project is gift giving. So if you ever come to an Earth Keeper event in the future, you'll walk away with something. And uh, Adam and Caitlin and Tom will be uh, offering you, uh, right following the grace, this gift. And would you like to say what it is, Adam, what we're going to offer? Uh, hand uh, pick seeds. Yes. Hand, hand harvested seeds. Again, not available anywhere <laughs> except uh, to the volunteers who have picked them, you can't get these at any store. They're heritage seeds of local and medicinal plants that you find here in the Upper Peninsula, as well as a description of the project. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna call on Charlie to lead us with song, which uh, people of faith always, always enter into. Let us together say thank you, amen. Let us together say thank you, amen gift of clean water in lakes and in streams. Let us together say thank you, Amen. For the gift of the grain milled into flour. Let us together say thank you, Amen. For the fruits of the earth in faraway fields. Let us together say thank you, Amen. For the skill and the labor that brings us this food, let us together say thank you, Amen. For the gift of each one here gathered in grace, let us together say thank you, Amen. One of the words that many of us in the Christian family have experienced in this Sunday, reading or hearing, talking about, maybe thinking about, is Isaiah 62. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, Hepzibah, and your land happily married, Beulah. Always been fond of that verse, my mom's name was Beulah. So. But what strikes me this time around is that the well-being of the people and the well-being of the land are intertwined. They go hand in hand. We could say a lot about that, but this is meant to be just the blessing of the food. Living in a place of great blessing and in a time of great blessing, we are indeed a people greatly blessed. Let us together say thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen.